Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Welcome everyone to Strength to Strength. If you're a first timer here, uh, welcome. We meet every Saturday morning at six o'clock, um, joining at the same link. So this morning, uh, Dean Taylor, he was with us for part one of a topic called Christians and Politics, a challenge from history. And so this afternoon, we're looking forward to hearing part two. So as far as the format, um, Dean is going to be sharing today here for about an hour. And then we're looking forward to a question and answer period following that for about half an hour. So if you have any questions as we go along, and if you're using Zoom, you can hit the chat button to submit your question. If you're not using Zoom, you can email your questions to contact at strengththestrength.org. So Dean Taylor is the president of Sattler College. He's a part of uh, Followers of the Way in Boston, Massachusetts. His uh, story is well known in part, of, in part because of the book he wrote, Change of Allegiance. While serving in the United States Army, he and his wife grappled with the question, what if Jesus, what if Jesus meant every word he said? And if you don't have that book, I would highly recommend you get a copy. So welcome, Dean. Glad to have you with us. Well, thank you very much. Um, it, it was, it's been good to, good to be with you. And, I, and again, I really appreciate, sorry, just adjusting something here. I really appreciate what you've done um, and how you're trying to make uh, something blessing out of our, our bizarre COVID situation and everything like that. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, I was appreciated as I read over some of the questions and, and everything, I, I, I made me assume that I'm kind of preaching to the choir and, and that's, that's fine. I, and I also appreciated that a lot of the questions were very um, proactive. In other words, they um, were asking more, instead of more questions of, of just general concepts of being, um, uh, you know, being uh, uh, non-resistance or something like that is what can we do and, and, and how can we respond? And I think even your questions that you brought, I think it was you at, at the end of the message, um, just asking those those very things of are, are are we are we just sitting here in America and taking advantage of of our of our situation that's you know people are doing things for us and people are fighting wars for us and those kind of things. So I thought what I'd do is I'd give just a little bit of my testimony and there's a few other passages that I wanted to go over that I, I did quickly this morning, and then so just to get the format again so it's. The idea is that this goes for, I give a, about another message kind of the size that I gave this morning, and then you have questions and answers after that. That okay. is correct. Yep. Okay. Sorry, I had it flipped in my mind a little bit, so I'll have to kind of get my slides ready here a little bit. Um, but let me start a little bit with my, with my own personal testimony and, and then get into some of that. Um, so I was, uh, I was raised in a very a very uh, patriotic home. If there's anything that I think that was typical to, to my, my, my faith or my life, it was just being, was being um, Republican, being patriotic and being, uh, and that was God and country was part of who I, who I was and what, what I represented in my, in my, in my life. And I mean, I can think of, you know, some of the different places my dad would have taken me to as a child and uh, growing up in Texas, like, uh, and taking us to the Alamo and, and there at the Alamo, you know, just the sense of, of <laughs> patriotism and the way my, my father would have talked about the Alamo and the, the saints as he would have seen them almost there. Um, it meant to me, and I don't know if, it, if there's anything it, if, that I got from that was just maybe a respect for people who've given their life for something, a, uh, uh, to die for a cause and those sort of things. And, I, and those things went deep for me. In high school, I would have continued this. I, I was, it was a very nominal Methodist that I was raised. And then from there, I went to, uh, I had a friend of mine who was going to a Baptist church. And then there at the Baptist church, the, the pastor really preached the Bible, really preached the, uh, you know, he was very Bible-based at the Baptist church. And that really influenced me. I remember that we used to all stand up at the beginning of the church service as my Baptist minister, and, and he would have had us all hold our Bibles, and he would, and we'd all say, "Okay, repeat after me: 
I believe the Bible, we'd all repeat, it is the word of God, it is the word of God. Every word of God is true. Where the Bible disagrees with the way I believe, I will change. And then we'd all sit down. And, you know, I, that, was, that was something to me. Now, growing up, I remember, you know, in that, in that same church and just looking at the different ways that we would have studies on different denominations and different things. And I remember just thinking, wow, you know, we're, we're really the right ones. And, and, and I felt a lot of confidence in that. Going into, the, going into high school, I met my wife in high school. We were musicians in the army. And as we were, as I got out of, the, as I got out of um, we, were, we were musicians in high school. We met in a high school band. And then after high school, we went and joined, I joined the army and ended up becoming a musician in the army. And then she came shortly after me and, and she came and first as a civilian and then we decided to make a career out of the army, and from there, we uh, she then went off to basic training, which was a really crazy thing. So I was living in Germany, just newlyweds. She then went off to basic training and the school of music for like eight months, and then finally met me back. And then we were decided that we were going to to spend a life in um, in the army. That whole time, there was uh, we had a very big community in Germany, uh, Kaiserslautern, Germany, where it was. It was 71,000 Americans lived there at that time. And it was, you had two different Mexican restaurants. You had, you know, two Baptist churches, a church split, and, you know, and, and several different things that were there. So even during that time, I remember when my wife was in, in basic training, I had, I had gone to some different Baptist churches, and one was a, a really more fundamentalist one. And then I ended up with the one that was a more mainstream Southern Baptist type that was there. And... And just loved it, you know. I I was uh, shortly after I was there. Also, was made an armor, which that means it's the guy who. My secondary job was an armor, so that was the, the person who makes sure the weapons are secure. Uh, you take people, make sure they they you know. Uh, you keep the M16s maintenance, and you do those things to make sure everybody gets their certification and all that kind of a thing, and. I loved that. I loved being a part of that and, and, and being with the weapons and all that was also something that I, I really enjoyed. So it wasn't, it wasn't, um, none of this ever hit me. And this is one thing I, a lot of people who ask, what do you do with evangelicals and are people in your, and, and many of you from an Anabaptist background, you got to kind of understand it's not like an even, at least in these days, maybe it's different now with, with, with the internet and things like that, but at least in my day, and I assume it is now, you don't even ask these questions. It's, it's like uh, this whole concept of two kingdoms and things. It's not something that really you debate. I mean, you might talk about modes of baptism or, or saved by baptism or sinner's prayer, you know, Church of Christ Baptist sort of arguments, but you don't tend to get in these Jesus following teachings at all. They don't, they hardly, in those days at least, they never made the uh, the headlines at all in our circles, and so I was going along in that. The the um, as a musician, I was then put into a uh, sort of a rock band type of a, a setting where we would go and play to these different places that were in in, in like they would pretend like there was a a, a Russian army attack and they would send all these American troops over and they'd called it reforger where the soldiers would come and we'd go play over concerts for them and that kind of a thing and it was terrible music it was just you know wicked music and you know actually after being converted I I looked some of those the even the lyrics to some of those songs I was like I can't even believe I was singing some of those things I didn't even I, I don't know if I even r recognize even then what I was singing in some of those lyrics but so my wife, then she got there and she was in that, that band too. And that became a lot of our, our um, identity for a while. We were traveling in that, in that little rock band and that type of a thing, all going through the evangelical or the, the, the Baptist church there. And it was all part of our, our assignments and as the army person. So everybody was, of course, very accepted. And then that lifestyle though with the rock music and playing all those things then we would know the the music so we ended up playing in different bars and and these these types of things it just had its predictable decay in our christianity and although i had been zealously a a baptist who had said the sinner's prayer but the concept of following christ as a disciple 
the concept of, of you know, just, just really that Christianity means following Jesus, again, was, was very distant to me. Another thing that happened that was important is that during my, when my wife was in basic training, I had an opportunity to go to Berlin, Germany, um, while my wife was in basic training. My mother had come to visit me, and I went there. And in those days, it was quite intimidating. You, you, uh, Berlin sets like in the middle of, well, in those days, you had an East Germany and a, and a West Germany. And in East Germany, in the middle of that was Berlin, and there was a 100-kilometer road that had barbed wire fences on either side that you drove through, checkpoint alpha, checkpoint, and then you went through this 100 kilometers, checkpoint beta, uh, bravo, excuse me, and then, and then to see for, uh, for Charlie is when you walked, then you got into the checkpoint Charlie, got, came into the, the, um, the communist side of Berlin. And it was very intimidating. I remember there, the, the guards with the Constantino wire, you had to go through all these briefings about what to say, if you would break down and all that. And I remember going over, through that gate, as I went with my mother, and I had to wear class A's, which is like the dress uniform of the, of the army, you know, uniform. And I went over there, and I remember a man spit down at my feet, you know, and I was just thinking, man, what? why do these people hate Americans so much? You know, I don't get it, you know. And, and I remember being on the other side there on the East German side, and we were like just relishing that we could – spend our money so flagrantly because what would be is about a, 10 times the amount of money in those days that you could spend by just crossing the border by going to a restaurant or something like that and and it made me think a little bit well what's causing this great difference and I just assumed it was you know and I guess it was a lot with the, the communism and, and things that they were under with with the Soviet Union at the time so <sighs> Then my, so then the, the back to my, our rocks situation, my wife's back now, we're playing in those things and that, that life is having its predictable destruction in our life. And we're beginning to say, you know, our Christianity is, is false. It's, it's just, it, it's, this is just a fake. This is not real. And I began to ask these questions and, and things. And I read a book, it was by a, an actual Christian um, singer, kind of a radical Christian singer. It was Keith Green. It was a book called No Compromise. And I, it was one of the first books I ever read. And I think what appealed most to me in that, besides it was he was a musician. But when I read that book, it was like, here was a guy who was completely sold out to trying to serve Jesus with everything he had. And I that got me. And I, and I remember just thinking, wow, this is a Christianity that I, I've, I've known nothing of. And so that began to, to permeate in our mind. And we began to then be, be uh, my wife and I were talking. And then, I, then it finally got to a point where we realized it was the thing the Germans called foshing. It's sort of like a, a, a Mardi Gras that they would have in, in America. And it's, it was just terrible. You, they would, you know, of course, like with Mardi Gras, all oh, the sins that happen in Fosching don't count. And, and we were out to play for this rock concert up there in Northern Germany, a town called um, Muchen Gladbach, I think was the, the town. And as we were there, finally, the, God had convicted us and we felt terrible about this lifestyle. And finally, we said, okay, we're going to make a decision. We are either going to be real, real Christians with no compromise. We took that from the, the book. Or we're going to give this up. And by the grace of God, we kneeled in a hotel room there and it was somewhere around 1988, 89, and completely gave our lives to Christ. And with this banner, no compromise, no compromise. So there's no big star, you know, no big rockets or anything it was sort of this commitment. We got up and we said, okay. So when we got back to our regular station, our regular base, we first quick got out of the rock band and, and God convicted us of the music and we got out of the rock band and that was easy. It was always people kind of waiting to be in the rock band. It was no big deal. I was still the armor. But then we just kept on this trajectory of no compromise. And, it, and, it, and we said, we would just get excited. We started reading and we started to take the Bible. And, and I, you know, I remember just, we would, we would encourage each other and challenge each other. And I never forget the day that I was in, in my, we were, we'd, we'd sit in our bed and read to each other. And the time that I, I, I said to her, I said, okay, Tanya, I'm going to read something to you. And remember, we had this banner of no compromise. 
I said, so I'm going to read something to you. And I began to read to her from the Sermon on the Mount. And, and I finished this, this whole concept, particularly that was dealing with non-resistance and how he told us to love our enemies and to pray for those who persecute us and to, to do good to them. And, to, and I got to the end of that and I said, so, so what do you think of that? And that Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And I, as I read that to her, she looked at me and said, well, it seems pretty simple. And I said, yeah, that's, that's the problem. It is very simple, but we're in the army, which makes it not so simple. And that just got us. And I don't know if there's anything, I don't, there was certainly absolutely not like an audible voice or something, but there was just this inward feeling that as we read those words, there was something inside of us that just rose up and said that Jesus was saying, I mean that. I mean that. And I can't tell you what a paradigm shift that was and it can be for every one of us when when we really look at the words of jesus and say you know what if jesus really meant every word he said and we started to look at this and i started to ponder it and i said we and we looked at all through the sermon on the mount i said so this is god coming to earth and giving us a sermon and he has things you know on the permanence of marriage he has things on not swearing of oaths he has this concept that we have to be faithful until death or or we're not really going to heaven he has a, a radical view of economics he has this loving of our enemies and not swearing oaths and, and and as i said to him i said you know i said to tanya um and as i pondered this i thought well you know if you would go out of your way to create a church that that would do every single thing that jesus said in the opposite so in other words, so if he told you to love your enemy, you're going to have chaplains and you're going to have, you know, jerk, you're going to have, uh, um, um, you're going to have soldiers, you know, soldier corps or something. If he says to, to not, to not divorce and to, to stay permanent to your marriage, you're going to have, you're going to have counselors in the church and, in, and divorcees, you know, encouraged in the church. And if he's going to say to, to, for radical views of economics, and you're going to be talking about how you can get rich in the, in the church and all these types of things. And I thought, I said, you know, if you were to do every single thing that Jesus commanded and, and the opposite, you'd end up with the modern American church. And that bothered me. And that bothered me. So I then quickly went to uh, shortly after that time and I went, I said, okay, well, you know, the, the theologians got this stuff figured out. I mean, who am I? Right. I mean, I'm this new kind of zealous guy and, who am I? So I, I um, went to the chaplain and I said, help me with this. I'm struggling with this whole love your enemy thing. I mean, you know, and so he gave me a book and it was written by the head of the chaplain corps and it was on the just war theory. And before I read that book, I was kind of comfortable that these theologians have this stuff figured out. But when I got to the end of the book, when I, when I heard their reasoning, I, I was scared. And I, and I thought, wow, if, if these are the reasons, and, and these are the reasons that Christians have been doing exactly the opposite of what Jesus said. And, 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 and it brought up a lot of conversation that was happening. The book brought up a conversation. It talked about this early church and it talked about how the first 300 years of the church. And he, I remember him saying something like that, that they were childlike and they were, and they were, um, naive you know and that later uh writers like augustine and and different ones that helped them to articulate a better way to to embrace the state with the with the teachings of christ and so i thought that i said early church that's interesting for the first time that book introduced to me the concept of constantine and and the concept of people like that and i said wow i want to know more about these naive childlike christians you know, I want to know more about that. So there was an interesting bookstore uh, in this busy town of Kaiserslautern, Germany. Remember, we had 70,000 people there. There was actually two bookstores, two Christian bookstores. There was one that was ran by uh, a man by the name of Paul Paval. And he had these radical books in there, but he was in this, like, the basement of his apartment complex, and it naturally went out of business. And I think the way I understand, he sold all of these radical books to this local evangelical bookstore. 
And so here comes Dean and Tanya and we're bebopping around and we're finding this Christian bookstore and we go in there and he's got these kind of radical books, you know, that are not your average ones. And I remember in there, I, I found David Brousseau's book, Will the Real Heretic Please Stand Up? The first book I read though, was a, was a Mennonite one by the name of, uh, by Ron, Don, um, John Driver, I think it is, on how early Christians made peace with war. And I remember actually thinking, that, oh, the, how they made peace with the war issue. This is exactly what I need. But it just made, me, it, made it worse for me. Because th this, um, this book even talked more about the early church. And I'll never forget when Tanya came around the corner from a, she said, look at this book. And it was David Brousseau. And David Brousseau had these ones on, on the early church. And I remember he also introduced to me in that book, I believe, in that um, about the Mennonites and about how the early Anabaptists were, were faithfully keeping these things. In that bookstore, I found the Martyr's Mirror. I bought that there and started to read it. I found the works of Minnow Simons and, and started to read these things. And I was like, okay, this, I'm finding my, I'm finding my zone. I'm finding, I'm not just completely crazy that there's other people that, simply believe that Jesus meant every word he said. And it was actually a universal, con con uh, you know, it was a universal thing into the 300s. So now we're starting to hear in the news, it's, you know, it's 1990, 98, late 89 or 90, and we're starting to hear about this guy named Saddam Hussein. And, and, and if you got to understand when you grew up in the 80s, um, that there was not much war at all from my high school on, in that time, you know, I grew up past Vietnam, where Vietnam was only a, a distant memory for me that, you know, and then the whole late 70s and 80s was this Reagan Reagan time where everything was happy and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and so there wasn't much conflict. So now we're talking about conflict. We're talking about Saddam Hussein and, and everything. And, and I'm, and now I'm reading these books and I remember thinking, well, I don't like this. So I start talking to the Christians at work. And I said, hey, guys, what do you all do with love your enemies and the fact that we're soldiers? And I remember one of them said to me, Dean, he literally said this, you're asking questions that shouldn't be asked. And I thought, and, he, and I said, well, what do, you, I, what do you do with it? And I read these passages. And he said, I'm comfortable. He said, I'm comfortable, Dean. And I said, well, I'm not comfortable. I'm, I'm not comfortable with this. And it began to eat at me. The... Um, and the more I would read, the more it was, it was discouraging me. I, I, uh, I was reading, I remember the early version, he's changed the version, but the early version of Tony Campolo, uh, he had a book called 20 Hot Potatoes Christians Are Afraid to Touch. And there was an 80s version. And in that, he had this whole story of this bomber or something who had this, this idea that he was saying, what would Jesus do when he was bombing people? And I had the job of, of installing his M203 grenade launchers onto the M16. And I had four of them. And I remember putting them and holding it in one hand was the, the portion of the, of the grenade launcher and the other was the M16. And I, and I remember asking there, okay, what would Jesus do? <laughs> and, and I remember saying, oh, you know, it's so confusing. And I finished the job and for a while, at least I guess some, there was some time when there was these four M16s with grenade launchers that I, I'd finished the job and, and it's, it was it was just troubling me and i was trying to deal with it and trying to walk through with this well finally it got more heated and we began to read more and we had uh, the saying uh, something that the america did something and attacked iraq or something had gone on in kuwait or something and they called us all together in the in the uh, briefing into the into the let's check my time into the to our main hall and they had what they call the deadly force briefing. And Tanya and I never, never forget this. And they explained to us that, you know, we were all going into more of our secondary jobs. And that, and I remember he looked right at me because he knows I was talking to them. And he, and he said, and if somebody comes in here or does this or the other, you must use deadly force. And I thought, okay. My theology, my my own personal wranglings is going to end up getting somebody else hurt. I, I've got to do something. Now, Tanya and I were, were sharing our faith with another couple, uh, Rick and Don Shirley, and we were uh, sharing our faith with them, and they were getting excited. And we would, we would meet at this bar called the Hanenfoss in, in, um, 
in the middle of Kaiserslautern and we would order these giant coffees. So they called it cappuccinos. They had all this whipped cream and chocolate and stuff in it. And we would get our Bibles and we just get excited because we had to be, wanted to be off the base. And I mean, we would just pray in there and ask God to, to, to be with us. And finally we had realized we've got to do something. So remember, this is, I mean, this is the 1900s guys. So, you know, this is the 1900s. There was no cell phones, no email, no nothing like that. To make a, a phone call was was a challenge. And so we then, I, I looked at the back of one of the books to Herald Press and I wrote a letter and I said, we're four soldiers. We don't know what to do. We're going to, we're going to go AWOL. We want to serve Christ. And I sent that letter to Herald Press. Herald Press forwarded that letter to the Mennonite, Mennonite Central Committee there in, um, Oh, they're the base right there in, um, oh, outside of Akron, right on top of the Akron Hill there. And then they forwarded that to missionaries that were living in Germany that were there to, to, to help the soldiers become conscience objectors. And, and this was very good for us. And so we were talking to them and they understood the regulations very well. And, and, and then, so we went to them and they talked to us about this and we've realized that there was a way to become a conscience objector. And we got the regulations and started that. And then that whole process then was, was very, very enriching to us. We started just digging into the early church. I started reading the Martyr's Mirror. I started, I started to go to church with the early Christians and the early Mennonites. And I started saying, okay, these are my people. This is, this, this is making sense. And, and that was incredible. Tanya and I then started looking to other things. And you know, modest dress. We started being introduced to the head covering for the first time, and and some of those different things. And it and it was just a, a very powerful time for us. Well, then, so after it was a, one of those very dramatic times. I remember going up and and where we submitted to the commander that we were going to be conscious objectors. We had a staircase, and I went up there, and it was an old building, old Turkish building, and you know, saluting and telling the commander, you know, we are here to submit to the application for become conscious objectors. I laid the, the regulations that I got from the Mennonite counselors there on his desk. And it was just deadly silent. And I'm not good with silence. I'm the kind of guy that always says something dumb. And, and um, it was an intense moment. It was just quiet. And I remember saying a few silly things or something like, you know, I don't know, sorry about this or something. And he quickly said, all right, we will, we will expedite this as soon as possible. And I, I remember going downstairs and realizing at that moment, your whole life has just changed. What you just did, you will never undo. You have just made a fork in the road that you can never change now. And it's true. And I praise God for it. And I encourage people to make those kind of decisions in your life. So it started a process of us becoming conscious, conscious objector, a lot of funny stories with that. It's in my book, you know, we talked to the psychologist, we went to, a, um, had to see a chaplain, had to see different people and, and talk about these things. And we had to submit a giant paper uh, where they would submit our, our application for conscious objector that would be sent over to the, to the, the Pentagon somewhere. And then that, then they would make the determination. But the hardest part of that, I think, was the court trial. And so you go to this little trial, and they bring in witnesses, and they bring in people, and every one of us had to go in there individually. I had to go in individually. Tanya had to go. My wife, Tanya, had to go in individually. Rick and Don Shirley each went in there individually. And he just peppered us with questions. You know, um, and I remember he was asking us a lot of questions about being a follower of Jesus and these different things. And he asked me about different wars. I remember he asked me, do I had any guns for hunting? He asked me... Um, what I thought about World War II and, and, and just, and then I noticed that his questions, instead of being sort of antagonist, uh, you know, they began to be sort of leading. They, they began to, to be almost like, oh, really? Well, what about this? And, and he asked deeper questions and, and that type of a thing. And I just found that that was interesting. Before we went in there, the Mennonite Central Committee gave us this little white book on, on how to answer the question, the typical questions for a conscientious objector hearing. And, and I remember we got it in the mail and, and I, I, we got together with Rick and Don Shirley, my wife and I, and we were about to open this up. And I said, well, wait a minute. What did Jesus say? When you are brought before the magistrate, you shall not prepare beforehand what you shall say, but the Holy Spirit will give you utterance. Let's, let's toss this. So we tossed the book 
and uh, and just went in there and just testified of our of what God was doing in our life and and you know what was happening. And so that was that was interesting. That whole time period then was eight months. The war, the first the, the first Persian Gulf War was very quick. It was over very um, it was very quickly, and um, people were kind of going back to work. But here we were still in this conscientious objector status, and and dealing with this. I started to meet other people. I started to meet other conscious objectors, and I realized there, wow, so there's other people who become pacifist, so-called, and they don't do it for the same reasons. And I remember we, uh, the, our counselor would be having these parties over, and I remember one guy was doing it because a, of a U2, uh, a rock song that he heard, and and the other one because he, he said, I'm kind of a cross between a Buddhist and a Baptist. I was like, oh. Okay, all right, and and all these different ones, and and these, and I realized, you know, when it would come down to it, I just wanted to be a follower of Jesus. Um, you know, I mean, when I went to my Baptist church, and I tried, I, I went to him, and Tanya and I uh, met with him, and we just said, "Could you please talk us out of this? Because I'm reading this in the Bible, and what I'm reading about being a follower of Jesus, I'm, I don't know how to reconcile this." And he kept saying. You're not going to change my mind. I said, no, no, you don't get me. I, I want you to change my mind. I really do. I don't, I like my job. I don't want to leave. And finally, at the end of that, he said, you know, I think you'd be more comfortable worshiping elsewhere. And that was, that was sort of another breaking point where we had left. That was our break with the evangelical world and with, with, with coming out of that. So the, the time is over, and, I'm, and um, we're still just doing these odd jobs and some funny stories with that. But I, I remember at the end, finally, the, the commander, the same commander who was still there, wanted to come in and read us the reports from the Pentagon of our, of our application for conscious objectors. They called us up there. And I remember my first sergeant said to me, he says, okay, Dean, what if he says no? What are you going to do? Before you go up there, what are you going to do? And I said, I, I guess I'll go to jail. And I didn't know how this would go down. And so we went up there. It was up the stairs in this little tiny office. And I'll never forget, it was one of those, you know, another moments. And this one is another one of those life moments. And he had four man, um, uh, manila envelopes sitting on his desk. And he was sitting there. It was a little small office. And we're there, you know, here reporting and all that kind of military stuff. And he said, here on my desk are the results for your conscious objector application." Okay. And he said, but hey, the war's over, right? You have great jobs. I have the authority before I do any of this to just let you go. And that kind of scared me because I thought, okay, he's letting us save face. This is not going to go well. This is, uh, you know, this is not going to be good. And so what do I do with this? And so um, I looked over the others and I think everybody was felt very clear. And it was like, okay, no, sir, we believe that no matter what we want, this is what God wants us to do. And he sort of smiled and he said, well, that's what I thought you'd say. But then he looked over and he said, now, I want to, he said, but I wanted to let you know that every one of you have been approved for conscious objector. And so it was like a wow moment, you know, this, all this time, all this thing. And he said, okay, you've been approved. You, 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 uh, you've been approved to be a conscious objector. You may leave the army. And it was sort of, you know, a rejoicing in sort of a, you know, an army way. <laughs> and then, but then the moment, and then right when we were sort of happy and, and that kind of thing, he said, but he said, but wait, he said, there, there's, there's something that I need to tell you. And it got really quiet again. I said, okay. And he looked right at me. He said, I too now am leaving the army for the very same reason. And I was like, What? I mean, here the very guy that was trying us, that was doing the, the court thing, you know, who was asking these questions, that the, the seeds of the kingdom had got into his life and that concept that somebody on this earth just said, you know, I think Jesus means what he said. It permeated in him. It grew in him until now he, was, he, could, he couldn't stand it anymore. You know, the officers were different. They could, they could, uh, he was an officer, um, so they could um, go through a different way to relinquish their commission and that kind of a thing. It was different for us non-commissioned officers. And that started my trajectory then. Uh, we, we left and, and started in my journey. <laughs> 
been of coming into this uh, wonderful and beautiful world of the radical Anabaptists and Kingdom Christians that I've been a part of since then. Um, it's been a journey. And I have indeed found the teachings of Jesus to be true, that he says, if you give up your, your lands and your families and your, 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 your father and mother for my sake, that you will receive a hundredfold even in this earth and also in heaven. You know, the, I'm paraphrasing poorly there, but the, the passage is that you will receive this hundredfold blessing here on earth. And I've received that. Um, it's been a journey for me. It's been a, a blessing to be a part of this, of this world. And so my, my journey since then has been tried to, to continue that trajectory. I've wrestled over these different things. I've wrestled over his, Jesus' teachings on economics after I got out of college. You know, it's easy to be uh, self-righteously poor when you're living with David Rousseau and, and, you know, as a college student. But, you know, when you're out and you're then doing anesthesia, it's a different challenge. You know, I found in my life as I've grown into to, to immaturity, the different, there's different parts of the Sermon on the Mount that have, that have, that have stuck me um, and challenged me in my journey. And so my heart and my desire is to continue to follow him and to continue to put his teachings into practice. And that's where I, I um, would really want to do. And so I, I spent, to give you a quick, bring you up to date on, I, I, I spent the first 10 years there, I, we got out of the army and I thought, well, okay, I was going to be a Mennonite. And we, we visited Eastern Mennonite University and my, my counselors, their father was on staff there as faculty. And, and I was just devastated from what I saw there. And I, I, I couldn't understand how these people could be um, non-resistant, but yet have these different things that went with it. And, and it grieved me and I, I, I didn't know what to do about it. And it, and it, and it really threw me for a bit of a tailspin. So then after that, I, I met with David Berceau, I met him and started fellowshipping with him and then ended up going to college in Texas. There we spent 10 years and lots of funny stories with that. Um, spent 10 years with that and, and growing through with, with, with brother David Berceau and, and there. And then finally, after I finished school and then finished nursing school and then anesthesia school, then I moved to Lancaster County and basically for the most part raised my children uh, the most significant portions of their upbringing were there in Lancaster County. And, and then from there, spent some time in a, in a renewed Hutterite colony in Almond, Altona and Elmendorf. And now I am in, um, in Boston with the followers of the way and trying to, to disciple young people here in, in Boston at the college. And so it's in my, in my heart and in my life of my own children, my own life, I, I, I long to see this, this, this concept of putting the teachings of Jesus into practice and to, to walking after him. So I've been, I've been discouraged. And so this latest election, and as I brought up in the message that I, I shared this morning, I, I don't understand what happened here this last election. And I take the fault. I, I, you know, when I, when I look at, I showed those pictures this morning and I showed some of the abuses that we see in the Anabaptist people. Well, you know, I and, and several other brothers like myself have been preaching non-resistance for 20, at least 20 years in the Anabaptist world. And that still happened. And so I, I take the fault. I, I said, okay, somehow I'm not getting my message across. Somehow it's, it's not connecting that Facebook and these, these politics and these different conspiratorial messages are getting a message across more clearly than I am. And I, and I, I take the fault for that. And so that's what gave me the heart to actually dig into some of those things. I, I gave a series of messages during right before the election and trying to, to encourage those uh, people to, to wake up in this, to use this as an, as an example for us to wake up. And it's not just the politics, it's, it's to wake up and for us to truly understand the, the kingdom of God concept and the following of Jesus concept and what that means and, and how we're supposed to put those things into practice. You know, um, to quote the notorious John Howard Yoder, um, he called, and when he was speaking of the, the passage on uh, the, the phrase non-resistance, um, John Howard Yoder says, you know, calling it non-resistance is like calling um, marriage um, non-adultery. <laughs> you 
you know, it's, it's, it's supposed to be an active thing. And so that's part of the message I think that we, we have with, with non-resistance and with the kingdom teachings that it's, it's supposed to be about putting the, the kingdoms of the, the teachings of Jesus into practice. I remember when I was at EM, EMU, when I was right out of the army and, and I was, went to a peace center and granted, now I look back on this, maybe I was a little hard on them in my book, but, um, Peace centers tend to be some of the radical, the most radical left of the campus. And so I was in there and just hearing the radical things that they were talking about in their different concepts. And they were asking me questions. And I said, you know, I, I, I just want to be a follower of Jesus. And so this teaching is only part of my package of wanting to, to be a, a follower. And so a pacifist is not what I'm trying to be. I want to see the teachings of Jesus uh, come into place. And so and when we were looking at these things now, I, I think some of the questions were brought up. What, what about, you know, the left? And do you think that they're going to start bringing in some things that are going to hurt uh, liberties and hurt things? I, I think they're right. I, I, I think that the, the left agenda is very evil. And I think that it's going to do a lot of destruction on a lot of our freedoms. The difference, I would say, it's a matter of a wolf or a wolf in sheep's clothing. And I don't, I don't tend to see conservative Christians backing that agenda. And so I think me and several brothers like myself, uh, you know, Brother John D here and, and Brother David and, and, and several of you um, crying out in this, in this, this thing is because of its danger in the way that we just have accepted it. And, and I guess that's, um, that's where I'm hoping that to, to kind of use this as another way for us to, to talk about the bigger teachings, and that is the Jesus following. Um, and so with this last few minutes, uh, and then I'll open it up for, for our, our questions. I didn't finish the slides this morning, and let me just try to bring that up now um, where I was in some of the, the lessons from history. I took us through the World War II, and I took us to what? Um, Eberhard Arnold had had bravely come, um, and I looked at what Harvard scholar Benjamin um, Goosen has given us a lot of very challenging. He, he still, he puts out more things on just that are very discouraging on this. And then I will present this. What about the conservative evangelicals? So um, let me share that. So... Um, we go okay so that was the end of our video that i posted which just is, was chilling to me when i hear that man say i renounce that faith and to think that this was a you know a hollywood production equivalent you know in the nazi world all these films purposely designed to seduce the the mennonite people of ukraine to to follow their their ways and so um, what about the evangelicals of Germany? Well, it, it, when you look at the, this history, it was it was basically all the conservative Christians. It wasn't just the Mennonites by, by far. It was the Mennonites were just falling in line because the Mennonites were already be, being in association with the Bible-believing conservative Christians. And so here we have gatherings like this that you would have just seen the swastika and Nazis uh, regime and all these types of things um, propagated. Here's different buttons from the era, uh, from the, the, the Protestants, from the, um, the different Bible believers um, and in this. And here's another scene that was just chilling. This, these, aren't, these aren't Catholic churches. These are, you know, conservative Lutheran Bible believing types of, of associations. And someone uh, said earlier in my message that after the after the message, you know, is it is it fair that did the Mennonites know? And and particularly, I would say that okay, you could maybe say the Chaco and the Paraguayans wouldn't have wouldn't have had wouldn't have been privy to, to some of the actual scenes. But there was enough that was being said, and there was enough that if we would be washed in the 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 teachings of Christ, that should have alarmed us. You know, I remember when I became a, a conscience objector and I, I had visited my, my, my counselor had taken me to the different Mennonite, uh, Mennonite churches in Germany. And actually, I'll, I'll tell this story. It, it's, uh, and then I'll come back to that. It's, it was funny. Um, 
and then I'll finish my, my, my evangelical ones. It's funny, the, the, I'll never forget, they took us, and, and one, well, one time, Rick Shirley and I, and, and his wife, Don Shirley, and myself, and Tanya, we were driving just through these city streets of the city, these village cities of, these villages of Germany, and all of a sudden, we came on, we said, we said wait a minute, and then there was this church, and it said, Mennonite Kirche, and I said, Rick, oh, stop the car, this is a Mennonite church. And there's a light on it up, up, upstairs. No way. And we're like, okay, we've been reading about these guys. We've been, I mean, this is it. So we, I mean, we pulled the car in, and the four of us, four young couples, and we, it was a big church, and we noticed there's a light on. So we, we tried the door, and sure enough, the door is open. We went in, and we crawled in, and all of a sudden, we opened this door, and there was this youth meeting in there, and it was like, we startled them. We opened the door, and we were like, you guys are Mennonites, right? <laughs> I'll never forget. And they were like, yeah. <laughs> and to us, that was just, you know, from some other planet, some other world, and we just couldn't believe it. And um, so after that time, we began to, to visit some of the different Mennonite churches that have basically given up a lot of these things. Now, these had come back probably to being pacifists, but I, I remember talking to, I was, I was, we were going, we were singing at a church the four of us, and we went to this one, it was like a little village, I don't remember exactly where it was, but there was a Quaker man there, and he was 72 years old, probably in 1980, 89, this is 90, I, 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 90, and, 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 and he was there, and he, and I, and I remember asking, and, I, and I, when I was singing in the church, I noticed they had all these plaques, like they do, you see in, in European churches, where all the people that were in the military and served were, were in the church building. And afterwards, at the at the gathering, I said, so, hey, why, why, was, why are all these Mennonites, I thought they weren't supposed to be in the military. Why do we have plaques of them in the church? And he kind of looked at me and said, yeah, it's a story. I said, well, well, tell me the story. And he said, well, Dean, he said, my father was a Quaker. And I don't know, he said, uh, you got to understand, Dean, it swept over us. I'll never forget these words. It swept over us like a revival. I said, what? He said, yeah, it's just the spirit just came over us. He said, "There's a." I left the painting in my father's barn so that we would never forget it. And I didn't see it. He just told me about it. Where there was a symbol that meant to vote for Nazism. And I've kept it there as a reminder that we would remember that even churches like ourselves that we were, we just bought into the spirit. And so that was the kind of thing that we, I think we've all experienced a, a bit of this um, with what happened here recently with the Trumpism stuff. So let me now go back to my presentation here. Um, so this, this spirit, if you would have been reading the Sermon on the Mount, if you would have been reading the scriptures, I think you should have picked up on some of these things that this is not the spirit of God. Um, so let's go, oh wait, no, sorry, that's a different thing, um, if you want to talk about the atonement, that would be a different, <laughs> so, uh, so let's go, zoom, no, so how do you share, oh, there it is, share screen, yeah. Oh, here it is, right here. Okay. Okay, so we're back to the evangelical. So this kind of spirit was just taking over. It was it was taking over the church and and, a, and a everywhere. And you and if you've read that book, it's a it's the what is prophet, spy, martyr, uh um by the taxis or something like that by of, of Bonhoeffer. It's a very good biography, and he mentions the tension that even in his Bonhoeffer was speaking that even in his group, he was kept losing people to Nazis. That even knew better, that were that were open to the to the his study and, and looking at those things, but still he was just losing them and lo losing them to the spirit of, of Nazism. So here's some fascinating things. So here is in the um, Luther Memorial Church in Berlin, and this is the the pulpit that you would preach from in what appears to be either Adolf Hitler himself, or at the very least a Nazi um, stormtrooper kind of figure, right there carved in wood in the Berlin um, Protestant church there. Here's another view of it um, that you would see. And these kind of things were just celebrated uh, everywhere. Here's also from the, on the same pulpit, 
Um, you have uh, an etching of, this, of Jesus preaching the Sermon on the Mount to the children, and then over his shoulder is the SS um, stormtrooper looking on. This syncretism, yes, and this, this, this Constantinianism um, is wicked. And it, it, it is, um, we don't want anything, we don't want any spirit of this. Um, and so closet Republicans, closet Democrats, whatever they are, we need Christ without the stormtrooper looking over his shoulder there. And then here's the, the fascinating thing that I, I read in this book and went and I found the postcard to prove it. So this is Martin Luther's castle where he translated the, um, the, the, the German New Testament. If you've got a, a German Bible, well, actually not just the New Testament, the whole Bible, he, he translated in this castle right up to the Council of Worms, and uh, it was hiding out in here, and it was pretty impressive. I mean, he did it, I think, and I forgot the time, like two months, three months, I, I can't remember. It was like miraculous how quickly he did that. And this became sort of a, a symbol, a shrine, if you would, of a Protestant um, Bible um, um, belief in everything here, there, uh, here in Germany, in Marburg Castle. And people would go there, and even in the time of, of World War II, it would, it would have been a place. But they were so excited, and I got this from the book here and the Dietrich Bonhoeffer. They were so excited when Germany took over Austria and, and conquered them and, 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 and so-called liberated these people and now were uniting in this whole force that they wanted to do something to celebrate. So on this very place where they had this, this, this shrine, this place where the, the, the German Bible was translated, in celebration, they affixed this, a huge Nazi um, uh, uh, illuminated. They have their the lights, if you can see, the lights were shining on this and illuminating it in celebration of what Hitler was doing and the symbol. And, and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I think he mentioned it was him or someone, I think it was him, saw this and was just horrified. I found it, I kept Googling, Googling to see if I could find a picture. And I found this, this was a postcard from World War II that they had made in this. And I quickly took a picture of it. I tried to buy the postcard, it was already sold. But it was, a, it was one of those an, antique postcard places and this was for sale. Um, and I grabbed this image off, off the, uh, the internet and it was as proof that this existed. And this kind of thing happened. Now here's the point that I, I, I wanna bring home with this. At the end, everybody said they were sorry. At the end, you know, everybody said, okay, um, you know, things are different now. But here's the point. And I, I really hope, I, I started the message with this and I, and I hope to end the message with this in, in a way. That Hyperion, Constantinian concept of that's mixed together that we think times are different now and we're much more civil we're much more um you know if, unless we have repented from the entire hermeneutic the entire way that we don't take the word of god and seriously take the words of jesus in a practical way if we don't repent and come to that concept the same theology given similar circumstances will very likely once again create the same results because ideas have consequences. And so as we go forward, um, I, I, I pray, oh, oh, remember where I was going with this and I'll, and I'll close. So they all said they were sorry. The, the Protestants certainly apologized. Well, I don't know if they actually apologized. The Mennonites did, I read somewhere, literally publicly apologized for being duped into this. Um, the Protestants uh, certainly in history have, have wanted to hide this, this, this secret, and the Catholics as well. But what happened to the, the rank and file of Germany? After this time, agnosticism and atheism, which was always coming, encroaching upon Germany, that was being pushed away from Bible-believing Christians and Mennonites and Baptists and, and you know, the, the, the conservative Lutherans and all these ones, is that they were pushing this away and standing for faith. Now it was like, so you guys, you guys bought this? You guys, I saw you. you. I saw your flags and your churches. I saw you. I saw what you did, and, and, and they rejected it. And you, you had a wholesale embracing of agnosticism and atheism. And I fear that the consequences of our lip service that we give 
is this is as more detrimental than we realize. And then here's also a point. They didn't understand. The Mennonites didn't know. Okay, we can maybe argue they didn't know. Certainly the ones in the Paraguay and Chaco, we could argue they didn't know. The ones in Germany perhaps didn't know. But that's the point. That if we get our eyes off Christ and give our allegiance to something other than Jesus Christ, we could end up unwittingly giving our allegiance to the Antichrist, just like they did. Unwittingly giving our allegiance to the Antichrist because we got our, our, our perspective away from Jesus Christ and his teachings. So God help us. And as we now go into this, where there's uh, the, 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 the sheep clothing has been removed and the wolf is there in office and the, the democratic parties and all the, the wickedness that they're bringing in and all that, I, I don't, I'm not encouraged by that either. Um, but hopefully this will wake us up as a people um, and let's use these things and use our mistakes that we made uh, in this last election as an opportunity to encourage the general concept of, of following Christ in a radical and rural way. So I'll hand it over. Let's, let's close with prayer and then I'll hand it over to the moderator. Here. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I praise you, O oh God. I love you. I love you, Jesus. I believe in your ways. I, I ask God that you have mercy upon me. You know how many times I've fallen from trying to just take your words literally. And I pray by your grace that you would cause me to have, be able to walk in that way, God. And I repent and forever turning to the left hand or to the right, may your way be exalted. May your cure for humanity be made great. And so God, I pray for all of our churches that are represented here, that you would encourage us to take your teachings, to go forth and to represent you on this earth and that you would be glorified and be here. Lord, we ask you this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dean, for, for sharing. That was, uh, that was an amazing uh, presentation there, and I and, uh, really appreciate that. So I think we've had a very engaged audience. We have um, a lot of questions which have come in, and we'd like to go over those and um, have your input on them. So, um, to, to get to that, um, I'd like to have the help of uh, Brother Sam Fair. And uh, Sam, are you with us? Yes, I am. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So um, Brother Sam helps us here with um, Strength to Strength. Uh, he's part of the administrative team, and he's from Alberta. And um, he and I have together worked at uh, some of these questions, and uh, we're going to be uh, just going through different um, different ones. So again, thank you to all of you who submitted questions, and I think we'll we'll get started here. So, um, Brother Sam, uh, if you want to um, pose the question that you have there to to Dean. Yeah, for sure. Um, first of all, thank you, Brother Dean, for allowing the Spirit to work through you in this way with that very sobering warning. Um, looking at history and seeing you know where these ideas go we say, well, we're a long ways from that. I mean, we're so far from that, but how much of those concepts have taken root um, in our cultures already? Uh, it's a very sobering thing. And your question that you grappled with, what if Jesus meant what he said? It's a question that my wife, who actually this month, it's two years since she gave her heart to Christ. And that was one of the things she said when she read the Sermon on the Mount. She goes, how do I know which one of these I take seriously? Yeah, amen. <laughs> and I go, well, in comparison to what? Well, in comparison to the Christianity that we see around us, obviously, these some of them are up for grabs. So appreciate you sharing that. Um, and getting into some of these questions, we've tried to lump them together with topics to make it uh, flow well. Now, the first one here is... Is Jesus' kingdom political, and is that why we can't take part in earthly politics? If so, in what ways is it different from the way the nation of Israel and the Old Testament was political, where men like Daniel were able to serve in government of nations other than Israel? Yeah, it's an excellent question, um, and, it, and it's, it speaks on the different ways that our, the kingdom is, is to be um, practically lived out. From between Old Covenant and New Covenant. 
And if you want a, a, a very detailed explanation of this, I think one of the, the, the finest works that have been done in particular on that very point is done by a, a book by the name of Leonard Verdine. And, it was, and he has two books that I would strongly recommend that everyone read. And one is The Anatomy of the Hybrid, and that's where he goes into details on this discussion. He's actually a Calvinist um, Dutch Reformed writer who was an Anabaptist scholar. Uh, and, he, and he has another one called the, the oh, I see Brother Etzel, what's, uh, the Reformers oh, and their stepchildren. Thank you. Reformers and their stepchildren. Another absolute, he brings sources in there that, uh, that you just simply will not find in other places. And he makes a very strong point, and I think it's very good, that he, he uses the term a sacral society that brings state and, and religion and sacrament all together, which is an Old Testament concept. And in the Old Testament concept, it was devised in the sense that you had a, a ge geographical place that you would defend and that you would tell people, come and see. Um, in the New Covenant, that was changed uh, to a go and tell society and where Jesus made it very clear that there would not be an actual physical place um, that this kingdom would be uh, around all of us and we would be a this kingdom of heaven that we are in the embassy of that place of the heaven uh, that's above. As, as John D. frequently says, and I'll quote him again, the second section, that the, the, the concept of the church should be like an embassy of heaven and that we should show the whole world what the whole world should look like if it would follow the king. And so our, our, our allegiance, our actual citizenship is physically, not just spiritually in some mental theological sense, but physically in reality in heaven. And we are embassies, the now and not yet, we are in embassies now um, living out that that expression here. And so that's where the difference is, is that it's real, it's tangible, we have a real constitution and a real king, um, but our citizenship is in a different place. I, and just real quick, I gave this analogy a little earlier, so I'll give it quicker now. When I was in Germany, I wore the American uniform. I, in those days, I voted in American elections, played American taxes and ate American food, and in those days, watched American television, um, although living in Germany. Now, I'm a kingdom man, and I, I, and so that sense that I think of that I was, I, I don't, I didn't know who the Burgermeister of Kaiserslautern was, or, or who the Chancellor of Germany was. Or maybe I did, I don't remember. Um, but there was no way I was going to take part in that system because I was an American in Germany. Now I want to be a kingdom man in America, and that's the difference uh, of how I view those different politics. Uh, with that. So yeah, great question. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you for bringing that idea out that this is a literal kingdom. <laughs> um, and the more literal it is, the more real that becomes to us, I think the clearer um, our direction of travel and, and, you know, taking Christ literally will become. Amen. What was the name of that first book you mentioned? The Anatomy <laughs> of a Hybrid. Um, it's right. actually that you could find even a free version of that one online. Okay. Um, and then the anatomy of the hybrid and then the reformers and their stepchildren, um, the Overholts do the, uh, I think they do the anatomy of the hybrid and the other one you can find not always so easy, but you can at least find it, for, uh, a used version of it on Amazon or something. Both are Sounds absolutely good. essential reading, mm -hmm. um, and looking at scholarship of, of Anabaptist and kingdom teaching through, through the yeah. century. We'll um, throw up a, a link to those books on our, our channel there so people can find those. And moving on to the next one, um, how do we best explain Jesus' cleansing of the temple in the context of non-resistance? It's a great question. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a hard, I, I would say it's a challenging text for me um, and my concept. Uh, again, I, 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 I view the, te the Jesus teachings as literally as absolutely possible. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I never forget, uh, why well, here, probably the first time, well, it's, it was over 25 years ago, at least, I heard John D. Martin preaching in Oklahoma, <laughs> and I was with David Rousseau as a young man, and he was teaching these radical teachings on economics, and I was like, whoa, I never, I remember getting challenged in a way that I, I never heard before, and I never forget David, he stood up, and he said, um, you know, I dare not anesthetize the teachings of Jesus just to make myself comfortable, but I want to admit I'm not exactly where John D. is, is at. I'm not there, but I dare not anesthetize it just to make myself more comfortable. And that really resonated with me. 
And so when Jesus said not to, not to resist the evil, um, I think it's, I, I want to take it literally. I want to take all the Jesus teachings literally uh, and dare not anesthetize it. Um, the, the, the temple, though, it's interesting. If you read it carefully um, and not with all of our polluted thoughts, uh, uh, um, E. Stanley Jones has a particular writing on that and how he, he talks about this and how if, if you look at it, there's the, the, the knocking over the temple, the, the letting go of the animals and these types of a thing. We put in that, that he's striking people and he's doing these different things and, and causing these violence to different people. It's not in the text. I will agree, it seems like quite a commotion. <laughs> and it certainly doesn't seem very, oh, let's say, very Mennonite, you know, to do. Um, and so it does, it does indeed um, seem a very challenging scene. And I think we should look at that, that the church is called to be prophetic and maybe even a little rowdy. Um, and as I, I do say that Jesus is not only the, the, the complete giver of our truth, he is also the interpreter. And so I see that, that he was very passionate about what was there. But I think we need to be careful not to read into the text what is not there. And that he seemed to deliberately, he could have done a lot of things to those money changers, and he did not. And mm -hmm. so um, I, think, I think we have to just look at it and it's and being truthful with it. Yeah, excellent. And it won't contradict, you know, the other principles that he brought out, exactly. um, you know, with that one scene of, of his life. Yeah. Now, moving on to some of the tension between the two kingdoms. Um, here's a, a good question. When the country I'm a citizen of gets the upper hand, whether it be in war, diplomacy or economic power, I naturally have feelings of increased security. I may even feel an urge to cheer. But if a foreign country gets a one up on my country, it's easy to become downcast. How should a Christian respond to such incidents? For example, if China engaged in war to retake Taiwan and the soldiers of democratic countries become involved, how should I respond to the lost battles on the democratic side? And on the other hand, how should I respond to China if they're, if they're beaten back or the communists? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I, I have a, maybe a little bit of a different take on it. One thing, what I would say that, that really cl very clear two kingdom Christians um, don't wrestle with this quite as much as a liberal pacifist. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I was very disappointed by when I was beginning, when I first began to study non-resistance was the kind of anti-America, anti-leadership concept that you would read amongst the pacifist writers. Uh, and I really think they made a mess of two kingdom concepts. This is why I think Schleidheim is just so incredibly brilliant that in such an early time when they were um, identifying this, the Schleidheim Confession sees this very clear distinction that the, uh, that the state was given the sword and the, and the church was not. But the, 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 the idea with that is I feel that it's okay to love your, I, I love America. I've been a lot of different places. I've been a lot of different countries. And I really do think that we do a lot of things pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, I get excited about it. I, I, I fight this on some different levels. I, I, I have to even sometimes fight that feeling inside of me that, uh, that is these romantic, patriotic feelings even sometimes when I hear some of the songs and some of those things. So I, I fight with it even at a different level than probably most of you do. Um, but I'm not against our country. I love our country. And I, and I love the, uh, uh, many of the things that we have stood for. And it's okay for us to have a, a mind, too. When we see dictators and emperors and things do some really silly and dumb things, it's okay to say, you know, that's a bad idea. And, 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 it's, and we see, as, and I, I think I displayed that just at the very beginning of the message this morning, that God does use nations to do his, do his bidding. We are against sovereignty in the sense that God forces people to be saved and forces people to be damned. We as a people are, are, are rightfully speak against that sort of Calvinist thinking. However, we are not against the concept that God is sovereign on this earth and that he puts limits to countries and limits to things and will move nations and do things. And we see this both in the early church, the early Anabaptist writings, and we see it certainly in the scriptures. And so it's okay for us um, to be to understand that when we see God putting an end to things and trust that God is sovereign 
and that he will protect his and, and, and let people go this far and no further. Um, in all that, we have to be careful. Uh, Jesus warns there is the, the, so the leaven of Pharisees, but he also warns the leaven of Herod. And it's too easy to just get uh, our country and our things. And being an international traveler and working in different countries, it helps you, let's say, God loves the whole world and, and those kind of a things. But yeah, I, um, I think we have to be careful with that. But I, I do think it's okay for us to have a mind and an opinion and that for us to see things like this, what's happening in China today with the dictatorship and the kind of control that they're having with, with in, their, in their surveillance and things like that. It's scary. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's, it's, I think it's okay for us to see those concerns and to, mm -hmm. to, uh, to be awake to it as long as we don't get dragged into it. Yeah, that's right. Brother Glenn, you have something to say on that. Yeah, I appreciate those thoughts. Uh, you had mentioned earlier about our citizenship being in heaven. And I think making that like a literal citizenship, that's where we really uh, belong. That's our, that's really our home, our homeland, um, I think can change the perspective yeah. on this. And yeah. if we, if we gain that perspective, then no longer is this so much our country, but it's this country. You know, no longer is this um, um, maybe patriotism for for this land, but for for our real land up yonder. So um, you, you hit the nail on the head. Patriotic for the kingdom of God. Right. Yeah. Amen. So yeah. Hebrews talks about um, being strangers and, and pilgrims, mm -hmm. and uh, that means being you know aliens, like being non-resident. And uh, yeah, it's like I want to feel that for the country where I reside that um, I don't really belong here. No, and, and thank you for that. I, I don't want my words that I said to, to, to anyway, Phil, I totally agree with you. Uh, this concept of being soldiers, again, it's like me being the uniform in Germany, being American in Germany is how we should see ourselves here. Um, I just, I see that the, the liberal agenda oftentimes being this, this unnecessarily um, anarchist and anti-authority that I feel is destructive sometimes. Uh, but yeah, I totally agree with you, brother. Thank you. Amen. I think along with that comes the, the whole concept of the kingdom mm -hmm. uh, that you were talking about earlier. Um, this next one has a bit of preamble, but I think it um, leads well to the question. He mentions Daniel 10. And in Daniel 10, we glimpse the spirit world conflict. And angels seem to be tied to certain nations. And Revelations goes on. Uh, Revelations talks about, gives us more insight into the spirit world as well. And it's a, effects on the world we live in. And then Ephesians 6 talks about putting on the whole armor of God um, to fight against the darkness. So the rulers of the darkness of this world. These verses indicate that we have a higher calling than physical fighting or involvement in the world government, but we are to be involved in the spiritual warfare that surrounds the government affairs that we see around us. Now, the question is whether we're doing all, my question is whether we are doing all that God would really have us to do. And he says, think of the Pax Romana, where there was a peace for 200 years, largely because of the influence of God's people. And then his last questions are, our prayers are an effective influence in the spiritual battle of mankind but should we do it be doing more how do we girdle with truth footwear of gospel of peace shield of faith and the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit enter into the battle against the rulers of darkness of this world are there proactive things that we should be doing to join god in his victory yeah wow well, that's a that's that's and there's there's several questions that that kind of uh come off of that um yeah. It's, it's an excellent point on, on many different levels. You know, um, first of all, with Daniel, that is a sacral society, again, kind of covers the Old Testament concept, but it is interesting to see the way they, they worked in that, and it's challenging. Um, taking, I think, to the, the, the thrust of the argument and where it's going is, yeah, I, this is where I lose sleep the most in us and, and what we're doing with this, and it, and it ties in that it becomes more than just non-resistance. It affects our economic ideas. It affects our, our things, uh, how, we, how we view you know, slave labor, how we view these different things. And if we are here in America as conservative Christians, conservative Anabaptist kingdom people, and we just continue to embrace and accept the, 
the modern American capitalism and the modern, um, you know, cheap tennis shoes, cheap uh, things, and and realize that this stuff, and don't realize that this stuff came to us at the price of an American empire that that you know suppresses these 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 nations and allows our, us to have a, a slave labor and things like that. Um, then we're really hurting ourselves. I uh, we're, we're we're giving a very hypocritical message, and so. I honestly do think that we need to think more about this and, and what we could do more. Um, you know, I was just, b before I came to Boston, I was over in Germany and, um, excuse me, over in Greece and working with these refugees that are coming to Christ and, and seeing them wrangle with, over these huge economic things and, and realizing their lack of community, their lack of able to have jobs and different things. And I've, I've made several different appeals for, for doing church planning and people doing economic development and different things that they could do in the midst of this place. And it, is, it has been a little disappointing to see some of the, um, the, uh, the, the response to that. Uh, and then there's even the conflict areas itself. I, I was remember reading some Shane Claiborne. He's a, a very far left um, Neo-Anabaptist, it would maybe use the term, and himself going into areas of Iraq and being a peacemaker in some of these areas and, and offering those things in ways, in some of those ways we would disagree with, but nevertheless being there. And I'm, and I'm concerned how easily we just keep rolling over and, and not doing that. Uh, a brother here in Boston, uh, Zach Johnson, I think he was on here as well. Um, he is also a conscious objector. Uh, came out of the Air Force Academy, and we are dealing right now in Boston. We're just trying to to ponder this very thing: how can we set up bases where we can get people out of the genteel uh, Bostonian uh, concept and get them to developing countries, and get and get to places where we can 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 have a response in sort of in some of these areas. And I think there needs to be more. I I uh, it doesn't have to be radical. It doesn't have to be crazy, but it does maybe be 1%. It needs to be 1% growth that we begin to think this way and, and to not just embrace the American capitalism and the American um, covering that those, army, those armed forces have done. And so, yeah, I, it's, a, it's a loaded, it's a loaded, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very big question and it's a big answer, but the bottom line is I think, yes, there's a much more we need to do. And I think that we have uh, a lot of growth in that area that we should be growing in. Yeah, I would agree with that. I just read a book on world hunger and I went into it with the idea that, you know, to see what is um, feeding the issue of 800, 800 million people going hungry. And I was actually quite surprised with the gut feeling I got out of it by the time I was finished. It was along the lines of what you're just talking about, that we have a responsibility here in the West, um, all the wonderful things that we enjoy you know, the, that we um, consider privileges or rights or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. um, that that's actually feeding into the capitalist idea that's basically subjugating these 800 million people to the, to the position that they're in. And that was a bit of a startling revelation. There, so to be on, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I think, yeah. To be on the offense would be to, to think about these things that have become a part of our lives more so yeah. than we think. And to look at the repercussions of what that is and then go on the offense in that way. Amen. I, I've been, uh, if, if, I don't know, a book that I could recommend, uh, Gary Miller has uh, some with Christian Aid Ministry, have, have released several books on this with economics. He's also done on church matters, which goes into a lot of really good perspectives on this. I've been talking with, with Brother Gary, just even how we do the, the refugee things in Greece and trying to create economic communities over there. And um, I'm excited about that. It's very small. We're, we're starting a farm uh, sort of a project ourselves, but we just need ideas and, and try things that we can, can get us out of just our comfort uh, zones. So yes, brother, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, we should be tackling these difficult things for sure. Mm -hmm. um, there's a group of questions here that are around a very similar topic about engaging in political discussions. Um, one of them is, should a Christian involve themselves in political conversations among themselves in the community? Also, is it okay for a Christian to discuss politics with others? And I'm guessing that that would be, um, you know, maybe people that aren't in our fellowship. Um, there was another one that came in that said, the story gets circulated that Anabaptists 
in Anabaptist settings of a Christian approaching several men of the world in deep political discussions and joining them. Um, and then one of them turns to the Christians and says, do you vote? The answer was no. And then he says, what right do you have to discuss that with us? Um, so what's your take on that? It's great. Um, again, a mini level question there. Uh, it's funny. It's funny talking about politics you think would be safe with radicals. Um, it, it's amazing here in Boston. I, I could think of several different con pretty, pretty, pretty conflict, you know, a, a little bit of a we need to have a brothers meeting to talk about this kind of stuff, you know, where people are getting offended by uh, one side or the other. And um, it's amazing. So I, I think, you know, wow, it's, it's 11 that we have to be careful with, but I do encourage that it, it does bring conversation. It talks about world events and we need to be, um, you know, we need to be doing some of that stuff. But, uh, but yeah, it's the whole, the whole politic thing. There was something else in the latter part of your question. Um, you said, well, the last question was about you know, the, the talking to someone that's outside of the fellowship or like oh, and then you, don't, well, you don't have a right to say something. right yeah so, so i'm first in F, i'm first in lancaster county i'm working doing anesthesia at the effort of hospital and my boss uh is an anesthesiologist there he's a jewish man this is when george bush was coming through and everything and there was a lot of hoopla there and um he was asking me so do you uh do you mennonites you anabaptist votes this jewish man's asking me i was like i just was new to, to lancaster county i said oh no sir we, no, 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 we don't vote. Uh -uh. And he's like, what are you talking about? I, I thought you, you guys vote. I said, no, 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 we haven't voted for centuries. We don't do that. And he goes, and, and our patient right before us was this, was this Amish man that we were about to do the anesthesia on. And he goes, so you're telling me that Amish guy wouldn't vote? I said, are you kidding me? Of course he wouldn't vote. I mean, no way. And he goes, and I said, ask him. So he goes, okay, I will. So he walks over, I don't know what his name was. He said, you know, hey, Amos, um, you know, so... Um, you know, so we're just wondering, do you, do you, are you going to vote in this election? I'll never forget. I mean, I'm brand new in Lancaster County and he turns around and he says, you better believe I'm going to vote. He said, I voted in the last election. I sure I'm going to vote in this one. And I was like, Ugh. I just hung my head. But then here's the interesting thing. I got in the break room and this Baptist man was there. He said, Hey Dean, you might have asked you a question. And I said, no, of course. I, and he said, I'm just curious on that Amishman's response. I said, okay, please. <laughs> and he goes, so if he's kind of vote, how is he a conscientious objector? And I said, what? He said, well, how is he going to vote for the commander in chief and then be a conscientious objector? And I said, you get that? <laughs> mm -hmm. I said, you yeah. get that. And most of our people don't mm -hmm. get that. And I was, I was just amazed to see that I hear this Baptist man who did not have a two kingdom view um, was able to perceive this thing um, and that this whole voting actually makes us not able to, to have a, a voice in some of these things. But yeah, Amen. We, we, our voice should be prophetic built upon the word of God and not on a right to vote. Amen. Yeah. Um, Brother Glenn, would you have something to share there? Yeah. So I, I appreciate that. So you had mentioned earlier in the, in the lecture that uh, you said the evangelicals just don't think about some of these questions about, you know, does Jesus really mean every word he said, you know, how does that, um, but evidently it's not just them that don't think about it. Um, you know, the story that you just gave here of this Amish man, he didn't really, you know, think about what the contradiction is there, right? Mm -hmm. So um, how do we like um, bring that to people's um, mental consciousness, you know, to, to see that, look, there's a disparity here. Like this doesn't doesn't work together. Great question. And, and this is why I purposely hit on these little sayings that I do, you know, and because evangelicals love Jesus, they really do. And they, they, they love to talk about him and they certainly don't want to be thought of as not being a follower of Jesus. So this is why I ask questions like that because what if Jesus really meant every word he said? Because the, the answer was, well, of course he does. And then like, and that concept is like, well, then have you ever read them thinking that maybe this is an actual teaching? Because these sermons are so often just made such plithy little remark, uh, you know, uh, meditations that they don't have a practical application. Um, and so, you know, I ask the question sometimes, can a person be a follower of Christ without following Christ. 
And it's amazing how many people say, I remember I was doing it to a youth group one time. They're like, well, yeah, like, really, <laughs> really? how does that work? <laughs> You know, and so yeah. the whole reason I do that is just bring it to Jesus. Let all the other stuff away and say, hey, let's just let's just talk. Let's just open up the words of Jesus and say, so how would we put that into practice? You know, and then it's a it's amazing. It might be the very first time those evangelicals have ever, ever had a real decision, a real discussion from a guy who like, wait a minute. So you you actually think he means that practically. And that just starts to unravel in their lives. They probably won't show it on the first, um, the first showing, um, but it, it gets to you. It gets mm -hmm. to you. And um, yeah. I think that's the direction to go is to, just to lift up Jesus. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, we uh, used to attend a Baptist church and we definitely hear messages on following in the steps of Christ, conforming mm -hmm. to his image and all these things. Yeah. And now I look back and I go, well, what were they talking about? Was it some kind of a fantasy or like, how do you conform in the image of Christ without becoming like Christ was, which was his teachings? You can't right. separate the two of them, but Thank they've you. created this gray area of, you know, I'm a lover of Christ, but I don't love the way he acted, basically, or something right. like that. Right. Yeah, you know, the, the, even at a Christological level, yeah. you, you hit the nail on the head. You can't separate the teachings of Christ from the person of Christ. Amen. Amen. And he didn't teach like you and me. He doesn't, you know, study the night before and try to do his best message. They came from Christ. Mm -hmm. And so to separate his teachings, even from his personhood, I think, I, I wonder if some theologian could make it, uh, take it to the whole Christological level. It's, mm -hmm. you can't separate those things. Amen. So we're um, at uh, just about 4.30. Uh, how much more time would you have, Dean, if we were to, um, if, if, if you're available, we'd have more questions. Maybe a, a few more minutes for sure. Uh, take a few more for sure. Okay. Maybe okay. Uh, 10 more minutes. Sure. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Sam. Okay. Um, one uh, person asked if you've had an opportunity to take this, uh, take your slideshow of Anabaptist politics to Amish communities. Yeah, it's funny you should mention that. Um, uh, just a month ago, a uh, month and a half ago, I was in Goshen. And while I was there, um, I was able to, to meet with a, a, a group of, of, really, I was blessed with a group of leaders amongst the Amish at a sawmill there. Uh, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned, but it's the, uh, um, and was really blessed with, I, I, I gave my testimony, I didn't give a slideshow to respect their, their convictions on that, but was able to give my, my um, testimony and encourage them to not to fall into the trap of, of, what was happening amongst their people, and they were thrilled with it. Um, they really encouraged me to come back and actually speak to their youth because of the COVID. It's it's difficult to do that, and, but I have an invitation to do that, and I really would like to encourage them um, not to to get involved with this, you know, um, because it's 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 serious, and and it, and it's and it gets deeper. So yeah, I'd, I I like to encourage them that and to kind of to wake them up and 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 or to, to remind them that this is a danger and and many of them are trying to do it to show their support and be good americans because they're so accused of being separatists and all this and so they're trying and their 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 um desire is to try to show the world hey we're not all we don't just we're not just apathetic we're we care um but they don't realize they're they're losing the very thing that people are looking for an, an answer people are looking for for something that's different and so yeah right. I, uh, I wouldn't do a slideshow but i certainly would encourage them Mm -hmm. not to get involved with that um back to i guess this one would go back to a discussion we had a little bit earlier um about the effects of the the, the world we live in in the west how come we insist democracy and freedom of religion are a blessing in light of matthew 5 10 to 12 and in light of what it has done to christianity as a whole and also in light of historical christianity <laughs> that's a yeah that's loaded you know even in the uh even in the greek philosophers question democracy and certainly you pick this up in hippolytus in the early church um, specifically has a work where he he uh, uh calls it into into question and uh and shows it as a sign of the antichrist i mean it's a big question and um and certainly i i am very blessed with the the freedoms and the the liberties that that our country has given to us, but I, and I believe that God has, has given the boundaries of those freedoms 
um, but you are right. Um, I remember talking to this Russian man there in Ephrata years ago, and he had come over from Russia from persecution. And he said, you know what, Dean, he said, and he was talking, he was, he was just despairing on losing his children. And he said, you know, when back in Russia, we defended our, our homes and we defended ourselves against the, the, the communists and the, and the dictatorships and all this, and we were strong. He said, but here in America, we have the saying in, in Russian where it's the, the, it's, there's a saying that means the squirrel climbs up and, and steals the eggs out of the nest. And he said that they are so let their guards down. And, and, and this, is the, this is the problem, that this democracy and this talk of Christianity and this talk of thing, it, 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 um, it seduces us and allows us to put our guard down. And I think you're right, Tim, we typically have done better in times of persecution in times of, of, of you know, things like that. And so you're right, I, I will take the freedoms we have, but we should not lose heart if, if suddenly we need to start making some changes soon. We don't need to despair. Our, our track record has, we've actually done quite well during those times, yeah. yeah. Um. Is there a connection between dispensationalism and pro-Republican leanings? And does this erode our non-resistance stance? Ah, uh, boy, that's a loaded one. Um, and yes, for sure. Um, you know, dispensationalism entering in with fundamentalism, even uh, with that, the whole millennial concept and the view of Israel kind of all wrapped up in um, and. Uh, rapture kind of theology, millenn uh, millennialism, and these types of things swept through evangelical worlds, swept through fundamentalism, and, and made havoc of the Mennonite church starting around the early 1900s, and, and particularly when you look at the history from like 1900s to 1925 or so, um, what fundamentalism, dispensationalism did to the Mennonites in that time period um, was terrible. Um, and so this e emerged into, you know, what became conservative evangelicals. We went, of course, to um, the, the scope trials and, and fundamentalism rose up and, and then, then kind of a middle of the road evangelical to create the moral majority of the 80s and these types of a thing. But dispensationalism has a lot to do with that. And in particular, dispensationalism then gives the, us an idea to put the kingdom teachings in this millennial reign um, mm -hmm. that we imagine and we teach. Historically, Anabaptists were all millennial, and, and so they didn't do this. But when, as soon as the uh, uh, premillennial uh, fundamentalism and dispensationalism came, they, they were careful not to pick and choose some of those things that were very clearly anti-Anabaptist. But nevertheless, a lot of this politics and, and political leanings entered into the, the Anabaptists during that time. So yes, I agree with you. I think that dispensationalism, even though we reject many of its, many of its tenets, um, it, it, it has affected us more than we realize. Kind of lets us off the hook now. If the kingdom's coming and it hasn't come yet, then, you know, it gives us a little leeway now, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, and sorry for any, uh, any just it, you, anyone can want to give some protest against uh, the millennialism. That's yeah. what we'll, we'll, uh, he can. We'll give it to him uh, for another time. But yeah, <laughs> there's um, a couple more we'd like to touch on real quick before we're done. Um, one of them is again to dispensationalism, I guess. Um, how does the perception that Israel will become a nation and have the blessing of God in the future millennium? affect our thinking of the two con or two kingdom concept i think it just really uh, lend itself to dispensationalism and you don't have to be a you don't have to be a premillennialist to be a dispensationalist and you don't have to be you know so to be fair um and so dispensationalism in general puts the kingdom teachings in a different era in general it could be heaven it could be the millennial it could be somewhere right. else mm -hmm. and so the the israel just was like whoa i mean you could imagine if you know, when, when the fundamentalists were needing to defend dispensationalism and suddenly you've got this stuff happening in the news with Israel, I mean, let's be honest. I'd be like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is it. I mean, look, you can read it right here. Here's what just happened, you know, yesterday. And so that really fueled the fire, I think, in this sort of dispensational teachings and, and where that went with that. And, and, and Israel then paid the price for that. And the Palestinians right. heavily. And so somehow then all in the excitement of what was happening in the Israel country and all this, 
we supported, even Anabaptist people supported the destruction of the Palestinians, the genocide and, the, and, the, and these different things that happened because it's forming the nation of Israel. And mm -hmm. still to this day, many places in, in Lancaster County, you would see on a, on a table of an older brother, um, Israel, my glory, and different things that would, that would lift up these, these concepts of Israel. And I, I'm, I love prophecy, and, I, and I, I, I'm excited that the nation of Israel, and I'm not even so far to say that God is not doing something in there, but that, that we, we drank the Kool-Aid of dispensationalism and embraced the genocide of the Palestinians and walked through that with the politics as it went through the 80s and 90s into today is disgraceful. And um, yeah, we do need to repent from that. And I think if we have the two kingdom concept clear in our minds and the principles of Christ clear in our minds, um, we'll be careful about the things that we support, like the, you mentioned, the genocide and things like that. That doesn't go along with the teachings of Christ whatsoever. So we need to keep that distinction Amen. clear in Amen. our minds. And even if yeah. you do believe, and even you do believe is God is doing something, this is fulfillment of prophecy. And I'm not even saying that's a ridiculous interpretation, but the other part of it, we should be able to see that is the kingdom is going to come down, right. you know, and, and from that, it's going to eventually not look like this. So yeah, amen. We should see the difference there. The last topic we can touch on, um, it's something we've all been grappling with over the last year and a bit, is COVID. And in regards to the restrictions that our governments, local governments, have been putting on in place that have affected worship and a lot of relationships as well within the church, and it's been divisive. Um, what would your, I'll just read this one here. It says, how shall Anabaptists live today in relation to requirements such as masking, social distancing. Um, if we're part of a different kingdom, should we be following these mandates? Yeah, that's a hot potato to end out with. Um, it yeah. It's been hard for us here locally. Uh, we've wrestled with that. I mean, okay, so several different levels. On one level, let's face it, you know, they're asking us to wear a mask. Mm -hmm. They're asking us, you know, uh, some, of the, some of these things, I think for sure we could do um we could do uh and in the, in the spirit of if, that the the centurion has has encouraged us to go one mile we will go two um i think the argument that macarthur was raising that you know that they're coming against us and that we can no longer assemble together i think there's a point to that and i have to say that it has gone on far enough that i i can see locally here that we have been certainly hurt as a church um, and, and been chipped apart by just, just breaking into these little micro churches that we're in. Um, we've been challenged though. It's, 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 it's a hot debate. I remember there's a family that came from the world, came into our church and the, and the wife was really wrestling with divorce, remarriage, with head covering, with some of these issues. And, and yet we were being really sloppy with, with mask and gatherings and counting the 10 people and all that kind of stuff. Um, and she challenged us and, and said, and I, I'm not for sure this was exactly the reason, but anyway, she challenged us that, you know, you act all, all scrupulous about these teachings and, and yet you're being very sloppy about the law and about these, these things of Romans 13 that, you know, mm -hmm. you should, you should be keeping. So we came and we, we tried to adhere to that and we, and we're trying, it's, it's a difficult balance. I, I think in general, in the spirit of Romans 13, we can be, uh, we should be more more uh, careful of this. As a matter of fact, I was at I was at Moses' funeral, and I went down there and came from Lancaster County, and uh, was there, and was walking around. And we walked into there with my mask on. Tanya and I were walked into that funeral with with a mask on, and then Tanya walks in there and she's hugging everybody. And I said, "If you're gonna hug everybody, then let's not walk in with masks. This is crazy." And so we took our mask off. But then somebody spotted me going through the line in the viewing and rebuked me on, on my message and said, you know, what kind of, what kind of uh, example are you giving to young men? And so, but I, I don't know, I, I felt they had a fair challenge. And so it's been hard. We're, we're, we're wrestling through this, you know, where we can easily keep these laws and they don't violate, I think we should keep them. Um, I think we should. I'm not even saying we're doing that necessarily, but I think we should. Um, where they stop us from gathering together when they're hurting the church. We do have a commandment to come together as a church. And I think that that's an important point that I think that it's worthy of us to, to continue that. 
Um, as far as these different regulations, I would just encourage us to please to watch out for pseudoscience, um, mm -hmm. for the agendas, for the, um, the passions that go with this, and try to keep our eyes on the kingdom goal and those kind of a things. But um, I, uh, uh, anyway, I, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a hard question. So. Yeah, it is. Are you out of time? Yeah, probably, but, okay. but yeah, right. that sounds uh, good. Yeah. No, I appreciate you taking the time to to get to these, and I apologize to our listeners um, for not getting around to all of them. They asked too good of questions, which started too good of a discussion, so we <laughs> it took a lot of time. Um, They're good. Some yeah. terrific questions, and it would have been great to um, to get to all of them for sure. Amen. Because these are our real life experiences and, you know, living out the kingdom in our communities. And it gets very, very, very practical. It really does. Uh, and very relational. Very relational. Very community. relational. Very yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. So thanks a lot. I really appreciate this time with you and uh, you sharing your insights with this. And I'll just turn it over to Glenn here to change or to uh, end it. Yes. Thank you, Sam. And also thank you, Brother Dean. That's uh, been uh, great discussion there. So um, we weren't able to get to all the questions, but we do appreciate all of you taking the time to submit your questions and participating in this um, in this time here. There was also many uh, people who expressed uh, thanks, and I'd like to just read a few comments. One says, um, I appreciated Brother Dean's point this morning that God's kingdom is to be fighting, but with different weapons, different tactics. May we be faithful, and may God show us ways that we can improve. Amen. Too often the church is looking for ways just to survive the political scene rather than actively engaging in the spiritual battle. And then um, this afternoon, you had a comment uh, about being discouraged about the, the state of modern Anabaptists and one brother uh, commented about that and said, don't be discouraged brother. You've been influential in moving some of us radically away from nationalism. So um, yes, there definitely have been um, a lot of people who have um, expressed interest and uh, encouragement throughout this um, event here. So thanks, Brother Dean. It's been a, it's been a pleasure having you here. You're welcome anytime. And uh, you. for all of us here, uh, these meetings are all recorded and they're posted online. Uh, part one from this morning is already posted on our website. And our website is uh, strengththestrength.org. You can also listen to our recordings by phone. The connection information to listen to that on the Midwest Conference line is on our website. Or if you don't have um, connectivity for that, you can contact us at on our email address, contact at strengththestrength.org, and we'll email you information on how you can listen to this on the phone. So that uh, brings us to the conclusion here. Uh, you're all invited back uh, next uh, Saturday morning. We meet every Saturday at 6 o'clock in the morning. Um, you can connect um, on the same link that you used uh, this time. Upcoming topics are listed on our website. Uh, next week, we're going to be having a discussion about vaccines. Uh, Brother Philip Hess will be speaking on vaccine dilemmas, past and present. So you're all welcome back for that as well. So again, um, Brother Dean, thanks for being here with us today. And um, appreciate your, your time. So would you uh, yet lead us in a closing prayer? Amen. Sounds good. And, and it sounds like it's even going to get more um, controversial next yeah. week. So, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> brother Philip has to say. so, amen. Well, thank you all very much. It's encouraging. And I'm even here with many of you. I see just in the audience, brother John D, brother Edsel, brother, uh, several of you just on my little screen here that, I, that have been really instrumental in my life and, and founders of, uh, or not found, but diehards of the kingdom message that I have that hit me when I was a youth and I just want to pass on that torch to the next generation that we keep going and keep lifting up Jesus Christ but let's 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 close with prayer Thank and you. I do very much appreciate what you brothers are doing and trying to um, take an advantage of this COVID apocalypse and and get some mileage out of it so thank you all for your doing that thank you for your support let's pray dear heavenly father we thank you so much for your grace for your kingdom for your way and we want you to be glorified. We want you to be lifted up. And uh, God, I pray, we, we, it's hard, it's, it's practical, it's real. And, and it's so easy just to be theoretical or theological and, 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 and in our little circles and in our, in our comfort zone. So God, I pray that you would inspire your church to, to be your embassy on this earth. 
And so God, I pray, God, be very present in our churches. Be here, be inspire us, God, and help, let us be able to take this message and, and follow your command. Yes, your command to go and to spread this gospel of the kingdom to all nations. So God, we ask your mercy upon us. We ask your grace. Uh, we ask the Holy Spirit that you've promised to anyone who asks. We thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Blessings, guys. All right. Thank you, Brother Dean. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend.